Good morning. Uh, I want to thank the conference organizers. It's really amazing, Evangeline and everyone who's been involved. I uh, really greatly appreciate uh, inviting me here and for bringing all of you here. And uh, I know it's a tremendous amount of work, and so we thank you. So um, I started teaching, um, uh, let's see, I guess I've, this is 15 years now uh, as a law professor. I uh, started at Texas Southern, the Thurgood Marshall School of Law. I taught there for four years and then moved to the University of Denver Sturm College of Law where I teach now in my 10th year. And as uh, um, Attorney Riley mentioned, I, I teach torts. Uh, obviously it was first year course, um, employment discrimination, uh, sexuality, gender, and the law. And for the first time in the spring, I'll be teaching family law. Um, and one of the themes is that you never stop learning. It's a constant uh, uh, evolution, and, and uh, it, that's true for all of us, uh, even, even the professors. Um, so in the fall of 2010, I agreed to take on the challenge at the Sturm College of Law as its Associate Dean for Institutional Diversity and Inclusiveness. Uh, we really settled on three broad areas, uh, really related to, to everything we're talking about here today, of, okay, well, maybe we need uh, someone um, who's really specifically focused on trying to diversify our student body uh, and our faculty. And so for the last five years, that's what I've really uh, honed in on myself. And, um, my colleagues and and our our institution, and uh, you know I think that I'm not going to necessarily focus on that piece of it. I think you've heard and will continue to hear a lot of about how to get into law school and about the importance of going to law school and why law school may be a career option for you. Um, what I'm going to do is offer you some insider information about law professors, and. Um, I, I want to do this in an attempt to kind of demystify the law professor a little bit, especially for first year law students, uh, which, which I assume all of you are going to be shortly um, um, or at some point. And, and of course, all of our jobs here is to help you achieve that objective. And at any point, I don't, it doesn't matter to me when it is, whether it's now or uh, 10 years from now or 20 years from now, whatever it is you're doing, whether you're still, you know, seeking to go to law school or you're a lawyer or you're thinking about making a move as a lawyer or whatever it is you're doing, and, and even if you're not in the law profession, please stay in contact with us and stay in contact with me. Um, uh, I'm easy to find on our website. And uh, I'd love to, to be a vehicle or an avenue for you in terms of access and information. If I, if I don't know the answer, I will certainly track down somebody who knows the information or can send you in the right direction. Um, but what I want to do is kind of demystify the, 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 the first year and, and really shift power um, in that law school classroom to students. Um, especially diverse students. Because knowledge is power, as you hear, you know, that saying. But it's not just about the content. It's also knowledge about the people around you. Um, and most importantly, in your first year, it's your professors. Um, it's your classmates, too. I think they bear, play a, a, a huge role. There's a lot of hype with the classmates. There's a lot of dynamics going on. But I also think it's really important. So first, I want to give you some brief demographics of, of, of the law school professors. Unfortunately, the data is the data's sort of old. It's uh, the American Association of Law Schools stopped collecting this information in 2008. Uh, the last year was 2008, 2009. Um, but at the time, law professors were 72% white, 7% uh, African American, 3.1% Latino or Hispanic, 2.5% Asian or Pacific Islander, 0.5% American Indian, Alaska Native. Um, so it gives you some idea, and, and my guess is those numbers might have shifted somewhat, but probably not significantly um, in the last uh, uh, few years. Um, but gives you some idea of, of the demographics of a law school professor. 62% um, of them were men um, at that time period. I think that number's probably shifting pretty quickly, actually. There are a lot of women moving into law teaching, um, and uh, uh, in particular also in, in law school, a lot of, lot of students. Uh, female students. Um, more current, more recent da data, three-fourths of all tenured faculty are at least 50 years or older. Um, so that gives you a sense of kind of the age demographic. Um, and, and I think another really important demographic for you is that uh, close to probably 50% are trained at the top 20 law schools. Okay. Uh, so it gives you some idea about that classroom you might be walking into and who is teaching that classroom. And I'm, and I'm going to talk a little bit. I'll reference back to this a little bit later. Um, 
And so I'm going to talk to you about demystifying the law professor a bit and give you six things you should know about your law school professor. Okay? And this is a work in progress. Right? And what I love about saying that, and it's what we do in our, in a, as law professors, because we research and we write, and we get to say, this is a work in progress. If you have any thoughts or ideas, uh, critiques, feedback, I'm very open to hearing it. Uh, and it's really a nice way of saying, I will take your ideas and build them and put them into my work. Uh, and, and that's legitimate, and that's what we do. It makes the work better, actually. Um, and I think the first thing I'd say is get comfortable with feedback and critique because that's what we do as lawyers and that's what we do as professors. And, and it's not to say, hey, you're, you're not intelligent, you're not smart. It's to say, hey, you know, we're going to have this back and forth. Uh, we're going to be critical of each other's thought process, analyses, ideas. Um, and that process, and that interactive process makes ideas and makes the discussion stronger and better. Uh, and so the more you can figure out how to not internalize that as, oh, they're saying that's something about me, uh, I think the better off you are when you're sitting in that classroom. Um, but to that point, the first thing I think you should know about law professors, law professors are not more intelligent than their students. I'm going to say it again. Law professors are not more intelligent or smarter than their students. Okay. You're, you're not believing me. You're probably saying I don't believe it. But, but, but I'm going to explain to you why I'm saying this. As law professors, we know a lot about our fields because of experience and time in honing our expertise. It is true that we are li it's likely that we know more than a first year law student about the subject matter. Um, that's, that's the subject matter of the course. But that is not because we are smarter or more intelligent than our students. We have studied the law far longer than our first year students in our class. I have taught torts for 15 years, sometimes three or four times a year, okay? That does not make me smarter. It makes me more experienced in the study of tort law. That's it. To assume that your professor, or, or in any context actually, is some omnipotent, all-knowing being in front of the room is a disservice to you, it's a disservice to your classmates, and your educational experience. And I'm just going to give you a couple reasons why that's the case. First, it gives too much power to the person standing in front of the room in that setting and in that classroom. Second, it can interfere with your role in your own education. Okay? Whether you like your professor or not, whether you get their vibe, whether you understand where they're coming from, in some ways, it doesn't matter, to tell you the truth, because you have to figure out how to get that information, even if you have to seek it out from someone else or teach it to yourself uh, using some other resource. That really is the bottom line, I think, in, in many ways. You're not going to vibe with every professor. You probably already know this, um, and that's true for your law school professor. And, and your self-education uh, and your ability to figure out how to get that and how to do that uh, will continue into the practice of law. Um, it's not, there's not going to be really but anybody to pick up the phone at 2 in the morning to call. Uh, it's going to be on you when you're sitting in your office trying to decide what direction to go in for your client or how to, how, what you're supposed to do to put in this brief or, or what you're going to argue. Um, it may just, just be you to draw on and that requires you to develop a really strong sense of self. Uh, confidence, know-how, skill, expertise um, to get the job done. And it starts that first day in law school. Uh, you know, for a lot of it's already started, but, but that, that's something, one of the things I want you to really drill home. Um, third, the idea that there's some all-knowing all being in front of the room that is your law professor assumes an end point to the learning, and there is no such thing. It doesn't exist. There's no end point. You can always learn more. You can always push more. You can always do more. Um, fourth, viewing the professor this way and others can kill your self-confidence. Uh, what students do is question their own intelligence and whether they belong in the law school classroom instead of simply recognizing that your lack of experience and time in. And that's really what it's about. And then correspondingly giving yourself the time uh, to acclimate and to develop and thrive in that environment. And that, that is a piece that you have to really take away. And there's a dynamic going on with your, your peers as well. 
um, your classmates this knowledge thing and you think, you know, literally I always say, you know, uh, in law school I felt like, wow, the, the person next to me stood up and, and, oh my gosh, I can't believe they said this and they had this, they said this to the professor and it was just so smart and so brilliant and, you know, they could have said Fruit Loop. I mean, <laughs> it really, I, I was just so nervous and so freaked out in that environment and, you know, uh, and feeling like, oh, well, do I belong here and questioning myself and thinking that this idea of intelligence and smartness is some static thing and it just isn't. So, um, and the last thing I'll say is professors buy into this idea too. We, we kind of like, you know, we get to use this to our advantage actually uh, in front of the room. Um, and, but if a professor tells you directly or explicitly or in some way that they are smarter than you or more intelligent, that statement is about their own struggle. Okay, that's not about them. Uh, for their own internal self-image, for their own lack of confidence. Um, that statement is not about you, okay? And remember that they are people too. Um, and standing in front of the room, we are nervous before class. We should be nervous before class. You should be nervous before you go into trial, always. Um, I worked with one of the most um, famous trial lawyers in the country, Morris Dees, and I, and my, I, I sat beside him in a trial and I said to him, well, are you nervous? And he said, heck yeah, he's been doing this for, for you know, decades. He's like, if you're, if you're not nervous, there's something wrong, right? Um, and so the professor's nervous, the professor, we, we walk in the classroom we're like, wow, I really hope I don't get stumped. I really hope that I'm going to be able to answer all the questions. I mean, we don't know it all. We're, we're learning it and we're figuring it out too. Um, and, and so you should understand that. Um, but some will buy into that they are all knowing. And they might not like the idea that they have to say, you know, I don't know the answer and I'll go find out for you. Or why don't you, you pull it up right now, you know, you've got your computers and let's take a look. Um, related to this point and, and Oh, it's five minutes already? Oh, gosh, okay. Uh, related to this point is that law professors do not know everything about everything. Um, and it's another way for you to think about how to uh, shift and retain some of the, the, the learning that's taking place in the room, okay? Um, so it, what happens is that there's a lot of information in terms of the cases and talking about cases. And the professor might know more about the substance, like I said, based off the first point, right, just because of time in. But um, students will suppress their contributions in the things they do know a lot about, in the fields of their own previous expertise in terms of a career, like if they were an engineer or um, uh, a doctor. Um, and this absolute deference to the professor once again limits the potential of the learning experience and gives the illusion that only the professor can impart knowledge. Uh, the cases will cover the substance of area law, but they intersect with everything. And so, for example, the expertise of students in my classes who are doctors and nurses really enrich the environment. I mean, they really talk about and bring their experiences to bear on the legal standards we apply to medical professionals who cause injuries to their patients. Uh, students offer their expertise as social workers, law enforcement officers, uh, teachers, and other jobs, other people with other careers and jobs in the class. Um, and you may think, well, okay, that's great, but um, I didn't have a career before going to law school, so, so what am I going to be able to offer? Um, and it could be things that you least expect. So last semester I had a student who is a professional motocross racer. You know, how cool is that? Um, and she offered really fun and important insights on the legal standard of care that we should apply to children engaged in motorbike racing who injure others. What standard do we apply? Uh, should, we, should we subjectivize the standard, subjectivize the standard? Should it be an adult? Is that an adult activity? Should it be, should it be applied to what all the adult standards apply to? Um, and then, I mean, for goodness sakes, I live in Colorado. I don't ski. Um, but I'm in Colorado. All of my students ski. Uh, that's half the reason. They either grew up there or that's why they're there. Um, and they really, when we cover skiing cases and injuries on the slopes, you know, their, their expertise and experience is, is really uh, important in the class discussion. And, and the point here is that we all have information to bring to an issue and to, to a debate or to a question. And it can inform the discussion and, it, and it, it's important for you to own that because what it's doing is shifting that, that and decentralizing the power in the room in this all-knowing, all, you know, omnipotent person standing in front of the room, that is the law professor. Um, I think the key, the catch to that is that you have to kind of figure out how to make it relevant. 
Um, and that can be dicey, um, relevant to what the issue is, relevant to what the class is talking about. Um, but don't be deterred because uh, the exchange, decentralizing the source of knowledge and expertise in the classroom is worth it. And when you get that little taste of that as, as the person who gets to talk about their expertise in an area and bring it to bear, uh, you can translate that later to other things, to other topics, to other areas that, that you learn. Um, and, and it's just interesting. It is a beautiful thing because the law, the study of law is not static. Law is not static. Um, I will cover substantive material every year in tort law. And I have new or additional thoughts about the cases or the rules. I've read them a million times, and I still have new ideas, new thoughts. And most of the time, that is usually new insights that come from the students and from the discussion in the classroom. Um, and so don't be shy. Um, um, put it out there. Um, law professors want to be responsive. So the third thing is law professors want to be responsive to student questions and concerns in class, uh, especially if the theme is repeatedly raised by more than one student. So don't be afraid to ask. Don't be afraid to follow up. Don't be afraid to ask questions or be curious. Um, and the, the thing here to understand is, particularly for women, is that women tend to second guess themselves. They don't speak up. I mean, studies, the studies are showing that women in law school don't speak up. They don't volunteer. They don't participate uh, in the classroom discussion a lot of times. Um, and you know, have confidence. Uh, um, have a curious inquiry and really want to know the information and what you're learning about and put it out there and push yourself if, the, if that's something that you're not comfortable with. Push yourself out of your comfort zone um, uh, to, to have that conversation, to ask the question. And, and I want to really reiterate this um, because um, I think one of the things that you should definitely raise questions about is what is absent from the material. What is missing from the material? Uh, you know, where relevant, questions about race, gender, sexual orientation, class or socioeconomic issues, globalization, environmental concerns. Whatever the topic is, don't allow its absence in the class discussion to be viewed as a sign of insignificance or lack of importance. The law is not neutral and neither is your law professor. We as law professors are teaching you the material from our own lens, from a book that we chose that has its own lens of the world and its own perspective, okay? It's not neutral. If you're curious about another perspective or believe that it's relevant to the discussion, raise it. Better yet, before you raise it, go research it and then raise it. Um, you think you're gonna get, you wanna get your professor's attention? You say, hey, you know, um, I've been reading about this issue and uh, Professor so-and-so said X. Oh, they're going to wake up. They're going to be like, what? Who? What? Huh? Oh, let me. And if they don't know who that professor is, they're going to find out. Trust me. They're going to be going straight to their office and pulling it and looking it up. And they're going to come back to class and say, hey, so-and-so raised this question. Let's, let's have a conversation about this. Because that's what we do. Um, and that is our job, right? And it doesn't matter what the topic is. Um, raise it. Put it out there. And just because it's absent, doesn't mean it's not relevant. It doesn't mean that you should not ask and that you should not raise it. And it's going to raise the level of engagement and conversation in your classroom. Um, law professors, so I, I know I'm running out of time, so I'm going to kind of speed up here. Law professors care about their students and want them to succeed. The biggest thing, if you, if you leave your day and take nothing else away from what I'm saying, go see your professors. I do not understand this dynamic. I am doing cartwheels and flips to the front of the room saying, please come see me. Please come to my office uh, or shoot me an email and we'll, we'll meet. You don't even have to come to my office. I'm not even going to make you go in at a certain time. Just shoot me an email. We can figure out a time. Students do not show up. I, I don't know what this dynamic is about. I have no idea and I'd love to hear your thoughts and ideas about it. Um, yeah, that would, really. I, I, this would be great. Because uh, if, if I can figure this out, then it would be really helpful for me to reach the students. Who do I see? Who do you think I see in my office? Who? The top students. The top students. That's who my, who's in my office. Uh, they're teaching me the law. I'm like, oh shit, let me write this down. What? <laughs> what did you? What was that? 
go see your professor. You may be that top student. That's okay. I want you in my office, but I want all of the students in my office. And I can't help you if I don't see you, if you don't come to my office. You're hearing it from the horse's mouth. I mean, I can tell you exactly what you're doing right, exactly what you're doing wrong. How are you studying? What are you doing? Okay, stop. Don't do that. Let's, let's back up, right? Um, or, or let's try this or let's work on your schedule, or whatever it is. But if I don't see you, it, I can't do it. And you don't know when you're sitting in that. You have no idea where you are in the class. Um, and, and it's really hard for you to gauge that. You know, you're kind of swimming in this huge sea, and, and that's what we're there for. That's what we get paid for, that's our job. Come see us, um, all of your professors. And you might get some professors that say, hey, you know, I'm not available, but that's okay, because what I'm gonna tell you in my last uh, point here is, is student evaluations matter. And if you are getting a professor who's giving you grief or being disrespectful or not meeting with you or, you know, whatever it is, you have power in your student evaluations. Don't overlook them. They're good for positive praise, but they're also really good for, for feedback. And I'll talk to you briefly about that um, uh, uh, at the end. One other thing, law professors teach, but we cannot keep our jobs if we don't write. We have to do legal scholarship. We have to do legal scholarship. We have to publish law review articles, okay? And I'm gonna short circuit this, pull the articles and read them, especially if they're in your subject matter field. If, 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 I write about torts. I have law review articles in torts. My students should read everything that I have written. Okay? Why? Because it's given them a lot of information about what I care about, given them a lot of information about what I'm interested in, given them a lot of information about what I, where I might pull from my test. Right? I like myself. I like my ideas. And, and I'm probably pretty far down on the chain in terms of my ego relative to law professors. Go pull their work. And you also might find you really like what they're writing about and, and you'll be able to, chance, to get a chance to uh, maybe research for them or you know, uh, uh, get a job from them. There are lots of benefits to that too. All right, last thing I'm gonna say, because I know we're running out of time. Um, law professors care about their evaluations, okay? Don't concede this. Don't give this power away. Do not walk past your evaluations. I do not, I see this, our evals, I see my evals sometimes, or a lot of the faculty, faculty it's like 50% of the students participate in, our, participate in our evals. Our evaluations are online, they're public. Everybody has access to them. You think I want a bunch of negative comments up in there? No, number one. Number two, I want I wanted, I wanted to help you. Our law professors want to help. They want to be responsive. They want to do something about the evals. And so, so they're, gonna, they're gonna take the themes and they're gonna respond accordingly. We teach, we write, and we do service. Those are the three prongs, three pillars of how we're evaluated. We don't want any of them to be light or negative. And teaching evaluations, student teaching evaluations, is how we get reviewed by our faculty, okay? By our faculty and by the law school administration. If you feel like you're not getting what you need in that classroom for whatever, whatever the issue is, put it down. Be specific, um, provide information, they're anonymous. We, most of the law schools don't even release the evaluations until the grades are in. Um, but don't, don't concede that power. Use them and take advantage of it. So um, I will stop here, but um, I really appreciate your patience and, and thoughts. I look forward to, to any ideas or thoughts you have about uh, this information. Also, for those of you that are lawyers and law professors in the room, uh, additional ideas or thoughts that, uh, that might be useful to students. So thank you so much, and uh, thanks for listening.